Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. My guest today is Kelly Weil. Her new book is Off the Edge, Flat Earthers, Conspiracy Culture, and Why People Will Believe Anything. So that subtitle tells you that it's not just about flat earthers. That in fact, it's about 9-11 truthers and QAnon and rigged election conspiracy theories and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and the whole going down the rabbit hole. Uh, approach, and that's uh, the nature of the conversation. We, we, of course, deal with the flat earthers, who they are. Kelly is a journalist for the Daily Beast, and so she's attended these conferences. So really interesting stories about the people that she met there, what they're like, what they believe, you know, who they are, what their political beliefs are, their religious beliefs, and what they, the correlates are of these other foundational beliefs that lie beneath flat eartherism. So don't think of this as a you know, conversation about some weird fringe idea that no one cares about. In fact, it, it's really a gateway drug, as it were, into these deeper, darker conspiracy theories. Um, and so we, uh, we discuss that and all the related ones, including sovereign citizens, which I've had personal experiences with. Uh, and so we talk about that a bit as well. So if you enjoy this conversation, please support the podcast at skeptic.com slash donate. That your donation goes to the 501c3 nonprofit Skeptic Society. And therefore, it's tax deductible, and the support uh, gives uh, support for not just the podcast, but also Skeptic Magazine and all their other activities. Okay, thanks for listening. And here I am very excited to tell you about a new sponsor for our podcast. It's another podcast, it's called The Lost Debate. It's not only a podcast, it's also a YouTube show for political eclectics who want to escape their media bubbles and engage in good faith with ideas from across the political spectrum. Well, you know how I feel about this. Uh, you can't just watch Fox News. You can't just watch CNN. You can't just read the New York Times. You can't just read the Wall Street Journal. you got to sample lots of different sources to get your news these days. And The Lost Debate is trying to do that by having three different hosts of the show debate and talk and discuss uh, uh the current issues of the day. They are Ravi Gupta, former staffer for President Obama, and a school principal who founded ARENA, an organization that has trained thousands of campaign staffers and helped elect hundreds of candidates. The second host is Corey Bradford, a political organizer from the deep, deep South turned TikTok star. Yes, a TikTok star. So that's pretty cool. And he once hosted a Fox News radio show. And Ricky Schlott, a Gen Z New York Post columnist and libertarian fighting to protect free speech. So I binge watched a bunch of uh, their episodes and they're terrific. They're just great. Uh, I, there was one on school choice, education reform, and so on. And because of that, I had Ravi Gupta on my show. And he was one of the most interesting conversationalists I've had. Uh, talking about a whole broad range of, of topics, uh, politics and education and all the topics that you and I are all interested in. So give it a shot. Check them out. It's The Lost Debate. They cover the latest news, ideas, and trends that most of the mainstream media overlooks. So check them out, The Lost Debate. We provide a link in the show notes below, or you can just check your favorite podcast uh, platform, and you'll find them there. Anyway, it's well worth it. I'm proud to have them as a sponsor of my show, and uh, I hope you give them a, a good listen. It's a lot of fun. All right. Before I introduce today's guest, our sponsor is Wondrium, formerly the teaching company, The Great Courses, which you're probably familiar with. I've produced two myself, consumed you know, dozens, maybe even hundreds I haven't counted over the decades. And now the, the new company, Wondrium, has expanded to include other content uh, programs as well as documentary series, which I love, and uh, and of course they're they're great courses as well. Now you can just listen to them uh, on your app, on your phone, while you're driving, while you're cycling, while you're hiking, while you're walking, doing chores, anything, multitasking. Uh, it's what everybody's doing these days. So if you do it, uh, sign up through um, my podcast. Uh, you get a free 22 day trial, and at the end of which you can subscribe or not. I don't know why you wouldn't. It's a great program. And uh, so you go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M.com slash S-H-E-R-M-E-R. Like, for example, here's one I'm going to listen to. Extreme Offenders, Psychological Insights. 
The names are infamous. The crimes are extreme. The insights into the darkest corners of behavioral psychology and the disturbing ways serial killers think and act. So it's 12 lectures. Each is, looks like a few minutes over 30 minutes each. So if you listen to them at 1.2 or 1.3 speed, you can knock them off in less than half an hour per. So I could go through this course in a week, no problem. For example, uh, lecture one, Rage and the Serial Killer. Lecture two, Cruelty and Lust Murder. Each of these has a character associated with them. Joseph Wacker, Peter Curtin, uh, Killing Hundreds for Gain, Bell Gunnis, and so on. Deception and Fatal Chameleon, Ted Bundy, of course. Um, and John Wayne Gacy, The Mask of Insanity. Isolation of a Zombie Maker, Jeffrey Dahmer. And finally, Retribution Day Killer, Elliot Roger. Anyway, great content. Uh, go to, to um, wondream.com slash Shermer and get your 22-day free trial. And at the end of that, just subscribe. It's well worth it. All right, thanks for listening. Here's my guest. Kelly Weil, nice to see you. Thanks for your great book, Off the Edge. Flat Earthers, Conspiracy Culture, and Why People Will Believe Anything. <laughs> yes, indeed. That's my day job is trying to figure that out. So I'm really thrilled to have you as a guest on the show here. And I should point out for our listeners right off the bat, this, this book is not really just about flat earthers. It's really about the conspiracy culture and people who tick the box for one, say flat earthers, also tend to tick the box for many others like QAnon or anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, rigged elections, and so on. So really, it's kind of a window into the psychology of the conspiratorial mind. So it's a much broader topic. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me, Michael. And um, that's absolutely true. I came into this really fascinated by flat earthers, but it's not the whole picture just to look at one conspiracy theory. Belief in a conspiracy theory is the biggest predictor for belief in another conspiracy theory. So once you're into one, it's really a, it's a rabbit hole. It sucks people in. And I was really interested in unpacking that world of belief and how people arrive there. Right. So before we get into that, give us a little bit of uh, background about yourself. Give us your, your origin story, the stuff that's not on the, on the back of the book. Where were you born and raised and, and where'd you go to school and what were some of your uh, influencers, mentors, or teachers, or and then how'd you get into this particular subject? Um, I am from upstate New York, quite close to the Canadian border. Uh, I have always been really uh, involved in or interested in skepticism um, uh, on YouTube when I really shouldn't have been at a very early age and very interested in um, in debate and debunkings, that sort of thing. Um, I went to New York University to study journalism, and while I was there, I uh, started following a lot of the emerging alt-right scene, um, and I was interested in covering that from an adversarial uh, point of view. But as soon as I delved in there, I started finding uh, a lot of conspiratorial content. And so as I was covering this emerging political movement, both in college and then later out of it, the conspiratorial narratives went hand in hand. So even when I haven't been explicitly reporting on conspiracy theories, I'm always in 500 conspiracy Facebook groups. I'm always watching the videos. So this was something that emerged out of a deep held personal interest for me. Mm. Right. So much of your data gathering comes from uh, uh, Facebook uh, groups that post rather bluntly honest uh, statements about what they really believe. And so you got to know some of these people online, and then you attended uh, some of these Flat Earth International Conferences, F-E-I-C, right? Did I say that right? <laughs> so what's it like to go to these places? How are you treated? Did, I mean, do you say, look, I'm a journalist, I'm here to cover this, or do you just not say anything? I'm always upfront with people. I I'm never going to mislead people about what I believe, you know. I'm here as a journalist, I'm here as a globe earther, but that said, I'm also here to listen. Uh, and it's a very strange environment being the only person there or one of very few who believes the earth is round. You're very aware that you are a, a, just a, a bizarre outlier in terms of belief. Um, 
That said, I found that people were quite willing to speak to me, if only because they thought they could change my mind. I, um, <laughs> I, I had, you know, on, at every conference I've gone to, I've started to speak to people on the first day of the conference and they said, oh, well, keep an open mind, you know, you'll listen to the talks and for what it's worth, I do listen to the presentations and they come around the second day and go, what do you think? Are, are you starting to, starting to believe a little bit? And, you know, it's, um, it's all in a certain way, very painfully earnest. There are some very dark parts of Flat Earth, but a lot of people who believe in it really believe that it will make the world a better place. And that having spoken to me and having, I think, come to like me, I think I'm a reasonably likable person, that they want me on their team. And so that, it's a very strange experience, that, that tension between someone thinking that they can help me by bringing me to Flat Earth. And that's something I encounter every time I'm there. What's the through line from believing the earth is flat to this will make the world, as it were, a better place? Well, it's interesting, right? Um, because flat earth in and of itself, it, it implies that there's a cover up. It implies that somebody somewhere for a nefarious reason is hiding the shape of the earth. And now people can go and run in all directions about that. You know, they say it's world governments. There are some anti-Semites who will, you know, start saying, oh, it's a religious conspiracy theory. Um, but people believe that once the cover-up is revealed, everything is, all these mysteries and dissatisfactions they have with their lives, they're, they're going to be explained. And that the veil is going to lift from humanity's eyes and we're all going to understand each other and help each other. And it's a very utopian worldview in a certain way they think that there is one singularly explainable thing about why the world is wrong and as soon as people realize it that earth is flat and not round that we're just going to overcome all our problems so there is something sort of alluring i i can understand that about the theory for people who are looking for answers you mean once we've toppled the lie that nasa launched astronauts into space and all those photographs are faked and so on, then other things will fall into place that, you know, the, the corrupt political system will be exposed and, and therefore we'll have a better political economic system that's fair and just, something like that? Absolutely. And I mean, I've seen it connected to politics like you describe. I've seen it connected to energy. Um, there's a flat earth theory that uh, the world is ringed in like an ice wall and that that wall is made of like some supernatural material and that's going to be free and limited energy. So we don't need to burn gasoline and gas prices will just be zero dollars. Um, so people can really connect this theory to the solution to all things. And uh, it, it's um, again, it's a very powerful promise for people who are looking for something that's missing in their lives. Mm. Yeah, you really get the sense reading your book and also watching some of those videos. They're all over online. And, and I watched that uh, Behind the Curve Netflix documentary for a second time uh, yesterday just to kind of bone up for this. And uh, you do get the sense that they're very, um, like, just totally engaged. Like, this is huge. This is bigger than my life. And this is going to make give my life so much meaning, much like some of the QAnon people. You know, we, uh, you know, the initial studies to come out on, you know, who, who are these people and, you know, who was there at the insurrection on January 6th? These were not, you know, wing nuts living in their parents' basements. These were not mentally disturbed people. These were like mainstream, uh, you know, normal people with jobs and careers and families and, and but, you know, that just talking as if, you know, this is my 1776 moment. This is it. It's huge. And you could see it in their faces like, oh, my God, they're, they're really into this. Yeah, I mean, I think this idea of like the hero's journey really figures very prominently into a lot of people's belief system. They really think that they are an awakened, enlightened main character of events and that what's going on is uh, not just a central narrative for them, but for everyone. Um, and you know, I, I, I heard this put a 
brilliant way by a former flat earther I spoke to. And he said that he really believed that when the truth was revealed, he would be one of, you know, only a million or so people who had been right all along. And that to have been one of those people preaching the truth and telling his family, he would have been famous. He would have been revered. And I, I think it takes a lot of vulnerability for somebody to come out and admit that now. But I think for a lot of people, this, be it Flat Earth or be it QAnon, is a purpose and they're looking for a purpose they're looking for significance and they're looking for that movement and that action that they can take that puts them at the center of the drama yeah i worked on this uh vox explained uh series one, one episode of the series for netflix uh, on QAnon, and um and, and then the you know the whole rigged election conspiracy theory and then the uh, January 6th and so on. Anyway, we found this woman who was from Texas, I think, you know, attractive middle-aged, has two kids, happy uh, marriage, has a highly successful career as a PR person. And, you know, just the, sort of the last person you would predict would do something like this. But to hear her speak, now she's kind of out of it now, so she came around. But but to hear her speak at the time and then her reflecting on it, well, like, th my life was boring compared to this. It's like your life is boring. You have this like perfect American life. And uh, and, and yet the, the idea that, you know, we're going to go to the Capitol and march on it and we're going to expose this massive cover up, you know, is is more entertaining or maybe it's more existentially meaningful than just a regular day job and, and having a marriage and two kids and just kind of the, the, the normal stuff most people do that that isn't quite so engaging. Mm hmm. You know, I think there's a very good reason that a lot of people compare QAnon to like a role playing video game. It gives people puzzle pieces that they put together and it gives people this. Uh, it, you can almost see the mental reward system work out in real time where somebody thinks they've forged a connection between Hillary Clinton and like a pizza parlor. And that in itself is we as as a species we love solving puzzles we love finding patterns and that is just such a a desirable thing to happen in your brain that yeah i mean listen it's the the, the fact of being an adult is sometimes it's boring you know you have your job and <laughs> mm -hmm. it can be rewarding but how much do you love to log off and play a video game and like that i think is part of the allure of these communities is the is the drama and the suspense and the narrative baked into it yeah this woman actually played the voicemail her husband left her on her phone saying if you don't stop this nonsense i'm taking the kids and leaving you and she's like okay bye it's like oh my god now that that's a commitment right i mean mo I, I would like to think most people wouldn't go that far you write about edgar mitchell or edgar welch in uh in your book the the pizzagate guy that uh, went to the Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria in Washington, D.C. So this brings up this question of belief. Do, do people really believe there was a pedophile ring being operated by Hillary Clinton out of a pizzeria? So Hugo Mercier, who wrote this book, um, Not Born Yesterday, he doubts that most people actually believe that. Because if you actually believe it, you'd do what Edgar Welch did. You'd go there with a gun going, hey, if the police aren't going to break up this crime. I'm going to do it. And uh, that most people, he said, leave like a one star review on Yelp for, you know, the pizza was kind of doughy. Well, that's not what you would do if you really believe there was a, a crime unfolding. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I think a lot of people hold belief and disbelief in tension. And you can see that just in the way that they n navigate their belief system and they change it as new information emerges, right? something, some central part of a conspiracy theory will be roundly debunked. Okay, so um, Edgar Madison Welch went into the pizza parlor, tried shooting it up to find the children and found, he, he couldn't find any element of the underground tunnels that he said children were being smuggled in. And that in itself did not actually snap him out of the conspiracy theory. So people can believe something and be confronted with tons of evidence to the contrary and still hold those two conflicting streams of information in tension. Belief isn't just 
fully accepting everything as true. It's a very selective process. Um, and I think with the conspiracy theories that we have right now, it's also a communal process. People are part of the flat earth community, they'll say, or they are, um, they're part of a QAnon crew of mine. You know, they've got their Twitter circles or their Telegram channels. And it, it's, it's part of an identity, I think, more than it is strictly a belief, like a religious belief or something like that. Um, and so I think these theories and the social forces behind them do leave room for doubt. And yet the people can continue to doubt, but still be very militant about these theories and almost act as if they were true, or at least preach them as if they are true. Mm. Right, that self-referential narrative that we're being persecuted for our beliefs by those okay. other people, and we have to kind of circle the wagons and, and be supportive of each other. That's a pretty common theme I find in social groups. Uh, back in the 90s, I did a whole analysis of the Holocaust deniers. I wrote a book about this, and I did a content analysis of all their journal articles, and then the subjects of their conference talks. And by far the majority was about people that criticize them and are covering up the truth and, 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 and the fact that they criticize us means we must be onto something. And then they throw some fundraising in there. You know, they don't want you to know who's the they, well, in this case, the Jews. And uh, mm -hmm. therefore you should fund our, uh, fund our program. It wasn't about like what actually happened in World War II, although that was part of it, but, but, but more so like what they are doing to us. And I noticed that with creationists as well and anti-vaxxers, they have this like, you know, they don't want us to let you know what's really going on. And there's a lot of that kind of self-referential narrative going on there. Yeah, I mean, one of the um, motivating forces of conspiracy belief is in-group, out-group tension. So people will identify with a group, be it flat earthers, be it anti-vaxxers, and that's their team. And they are very responsive to attacks on the group. They are very... Uh, driven to maintain the group's like internal integrity. And I saw this so often in Flat Earth. So many um, presentations at a Flat Earth conference are not about the supposed evidence because honestly, there's n no real evidence of Flat Earth. And they are picking apart media reports about them. They are, um, they are playing uh, cherry-picked elements of debates they had with Round Earthers. And in, in a way, stepping back from it, it's a little bit sad for me because it's so, um, it's very wounded. It, it, these are people who are genuinely upset that they're not being taken seriously. And that dynamic they have with the rest of the world really informs how they believe and how they interact with other people. And there becomes this sort of uh, reflexive caution around other people. They, um, they don't want to be hurt again. Sometimes they are afraid of sharing their beliefs, so they move even closer to the flat Earth community, and they don't talk to other folks. So yeah, it's um, it, it's a very self reinforcing group, and I'm not sure conspiracy theories have always worked exactly that way. I mean, to be a to be a moon landing truther, I don't know that there were those communities that really felt so um, bound together and so militant about it. So I think this is something that um, has certainly, it's a dynamic that is certainly strengthened online when all these disparate little belief circles can find each other and can form a community. Yeah, the no moonies uh, were always pretty marginalized and fringe through the 90s and early 2000s as were the flat earthers. And then much to my utter astonishment, what, what, what's the date you put it at around 2014 or so? They all just all of a sudden exploded yeah. all over the place. What happened? So I, YouTube happened to be completely frank. Um, uh, yeah, some people started putting out flat earth videos on YouTube. It's hard to pin the exact one. Um, and people came to it from, you know, various like, a, a lot of biblical points of view, finding some line in the Bible that seemed to indicate a flat earth, and they ran with that. But what people realized very quickly was that flat earth sells so well on YouTube, because you think about it. 
even if you're not a flat earther, even if you have no interest in ever being a flat earther, you're going to click a flat earth video, or at least I do, because I think they're hilarious. Um, and YouTube's algorithm, at least in 2014, recognized that people were clicking on those videos at a higher rate and it promoted them. If you had flat earth in the uh, SEO of your video, you had a really good chance of it uh, ranking higher in the recommendation. So either via genuine belief or outright cynicism, people started making YouTube videos about flat earth at just this exponential rate. And enough people started falling for them that they made other online communities. They made Facebook groups for flat earth. They started doing Skype hangouts for believers. And those Skype hangouts turned into real meetups and real community and came to the point where by 2018, I was going to a flat earth conference with 600 plus people. That's oh, wow. not nothing for, for right. what I think is the weirdest theory in the world. 600 people. That's a lot. That's a good turnout. It is for, for a conference that's charging, I think 150 was like a baseline price of plus travel. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So your sense is that at some level, most of them have some kind of flat earth belief. I, I suppose they vary in their commitment to it, but, but there weren't that, there weren't like undercover informants like you there, uh, that, that was, you know, taking up half the space that they, they, they were mostly really into it. Yeah. I mean, certainly there's, there's always media at these things. Um, but no, <laughs> these people were really into it. Um, and I think I know one of the best indicators I got of that was not when people were up on stage, you know, giving their talk and saying, Hey, if you like this, subscribe to my Patreon or whatever, buy my t-shirt. It was going to the bar with them, you know, you know, just knock back a few beers, talk about what you really believe. And ooh, they, they are hardcore. They I remember up. at one point, yeah, I remember at one point talking to this woman, nicest woman, you know, just just someone I I liked. I I find that dynamic a lot. Um, and she started telling me about flight patterns and telling me you can't fly from the U.S. to Australia uh, nonstop. You can't fly from the U.S. to South Africa nonstop. I said, hold up, I've I've done both of those. Like I can I can tell you, I can attest to that. And she's like, no, 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 that's not actually happening. It's it's you know the 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 pilots are doing this alternate route and i said but I, i've done that like i it's very hard to argue the evidence of your own experience and uh it, it's um that's where you start running into these i think insurmountable obstacles to discussion when i'm sorry i've done that i've been to australia <laughs> and that just doesn't really track in a uh in a flat earth logic Right, because, well, here's our cover cover of Skeptic Magazine. We did it a few years ago on the Flat Earthers. I don't know how well you can see that, but it's, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's trying to capture what they think is actually going on. So this is the dome that's over the Flat Earth, and these little two little dots are the moon and the sun, which even there are much larger than they would be, because don't they think the moon and sun are just like a few tens of miles across, and they're just a few thousand feet up, something like that? Um, and so the idea yeah, is that uh... you, to, to fly from North America to there, you, you'd be have to you'd essentially be going around this big loop and you couldn't possibly do that. And then the edge is framed by ice walls that hold the oceans in. What do they think is on the other side of the ice wall? So it, it's interesting. There are, there are some warring theories. I think one of the most dominant theories is something that's a, really popular among uh, Christian literalists. And they say that there's nothing else out there, that this is the universe, this little disc in the dome, that's it. Uh, and I've heard some people make very um, philosophical arguments about that. Someone said that she felt really small in the face of the universe as, as it was presented by modern science. And she goes, and then you learn that we are small and that we are special in God's eye. And, that that really that was reassuring to me. And I mean, I, I can sort of understand that. That's certainly not my belief system, but I can understand feeling more special and protected in this tiny little ecosystem that they believe in. But there are other models that people believe. Um, 
I saw a uh, someone running a scam against flat earthers saying that you can get to the other side um, and there's another world there and they have amazing science and free energy and it, they'll cure you of all your ills. And all I need to take you there is $100,000 um, per ticket. So, but I mean, people were willing to believe that to uh, inquire about ticket prices. And then this guy caught and ran with the cash. So if some people actually plunked down 100, 100K? I don't know. I don't have receipts. Um, I have transcripts of people reaching out to him, and I have him saying he sold tickets. I don't know if he gave anyone the insider bargain. Um, I also have people who are very, very pissed when he disappeared. So I suspect some money changed hands. 100000 I'd be doubtful. Right. So um, what do they think is going on when you look through a telescope and you see a round Jupiter, a round Saturn, a round Mars, for example, you can see that in just a small little telescope. I mean, they're going to say that those are uh, contained celestial bodies, that they are little lights in the sky. God plunked them there for this duration of time. I you mean I they're had in a this, very this crystal dome? Some... They're, they're, they're sort of pl oh. <laughs> stuck in the crystal dome? Okay. Yeah, but they'll they believe move. that they... Sometimes they call the top... Listen... Uh, who, who are you to argue with God's cosmology within the dome? I mean, they'll argue that they call, sometimes they call the top of the dome the firmament. Uh, it's a very biblical term. They'll say they're lights that are being placed on the firmament. I had a maddening discussion with somebody about um, satellites. How do they stay up? And well, you don't know what NASA's doing and what kind of trickery it's invoking to keep the satellites up or to uh, make us believe that they're real. So a lot of these more scientific questions, they just go out the window when you, when you try and debate them in good faith. Right. So let's kind of go through some of their specific claims that you can stand at sea level and look out. And uh, I think that one guy, Mark Sargent, lives in Seattle, said, look, you can see Seattle across the bay there. You shouldn't be able to see it if it was around Earth. It should be below the horizon or at least partially below, something like that. So uh, what are their arguments along those lines, and how could you test that? So flat earthers will make a lot of arguments about uh, perspective over long, uh, long distance. And basically, on a round Earth, if, it, if you go a certain distance out, the curve of the Earth is going to start obscuring your vision. And you can test this in real time. Um, you can look out across the Great Lakes and see um, the Chicago skyline, for example, being partially cut off by the curve. You only need a few inches for it to really start uh, start obscuring things. You can watch ships disappear hull first over the horizon. Um, you can watch the sunset, you know, little gradient by gradient. So they will argue effectively that that's not really what you're seeing. Um, sometimes they will use pictures of city horizons, city skylines, and say that, well, you can still see the skyline. See, it's, it's whole there. But what they don't show you is that there are 40 feet of skyline below what is visible in that photo. Um, so that's just an element of manipulation. And then when you do find an image that you would think conclusively proves that this is a skyline being cut off by the horizon, They'll say, no, that's um, that's like a water refraction issue or that's a uh, it's a mirage. It's a trick of the light and uh, haziness. Uh, so it's it's very difficult to argue these things. And once again, I mean, when you get a flat earther who is honestly engaging with the scientific process, they will often come out with evidence that proves the round earth. I spoke with a former flat earther who got one of these uh, long distance telescopes and he was really ready to find this proof for himself. And what he found over and over was you cannot see the skyline past a certain point because that's just the reality of the planet we live on. Wow. So did he change his mind on the spot or did you follow up and it took him a while or how does that work? Deconversion. I... How does that work? <laughs> I found him after he deconverted. Um, most people who deconvert don't 
advertise it, I think they're a little bit embarrassed. Uh, but he's one of a few people who has deconverted and who has gone back and tried to reach out to the flat earth friends he had, which I think is pretty, pretty noble. <laughs> um, and yes, so he was, uh, he was one of several people who has gotten into flat earth, earnestly tried to test it and realized that he was wrong. So I'm, I'm very grateful for those interviews in this book because they, um, after writing, you know, for a year and a half about something that is just maddening to me, it was a little bit of common sense at the end of the tunnel. Mm hmm. Right. It's uh, most most of us don't change our minds about big, important things in our lives. And if we do, we're usually pretty quiet about it. I mean, how many people change political parties or change religions? If they're in the public eye, almost none. Like when a politician changes parties, that's a huge, huge event. Um, more likely, privately, you just stop talking about it, and then you you just you just change your mind and 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 don't don't make a big deal about it. I think that probably helps deal with the cognitive dissonance. It might be good to hear to point out that that term itself, discovered by or described by Leon Fessinger, was at a UFO cult end of the world um, event that happened in December twenty first, nineteen fifty four. In which he wrote about in his famous book, When Prophecy Fails, he wanted to know what happens when the mothership doesn't come at midnight on December 21st, 1954. And he was with the Seekers, this group in, outside of Chicago. And uh, so he predicted that they, you know, they would, they would double down on their beliefs, which is what they did. It's a way of you know, rationalizing when you have two conflicting motives. You have, this is what I believe, and the facts are contradictory to it, so something has to go. Most of the time, it's easier to just spin doctor the facts rather than admit you're wrong if it's important to you. Is that the sense you got here with most of the flat earthers you dealt with? Absolutely. And I, I love that book, When Prophecy Fails, because what they did when their prophecy did fail is um, this group said, well, we didn't believe hard enough or we misinterpreted the prophecy. There was nothing wrong with the belief system. It was us. It was human error. And what I find in Flat Earth is people are actually willing to kind of self blog if it means that they can further tie themselves to this community that tells them that they are one of the select few that are correct or um, it, that they can find some affirming facts within Flat Earth that explains away their doubt. It's, um, it's very hard to step away from Flat Earth because people make fun of it, you know, people make fun of them for getting in and no one likes that. So they, they, they want to prove it. They want to prove why the, uh, the family members who are making fun of them are actually wrong. And nobody wants to come around and say, Hey, you know, <laughs> you were right. It's, it's a round earth. So I find it very difficult for people to leave a theory like this. Right. And, and part of the reason is because there's deeper foundational beliefs behind it. Uh, it this case, religion. If you're a fundamentalist who believes in the literal reading of the Bible and that the Bible was written by God himself, who is by definition inerrant, then whatever it says has to be true. So that's your, that's your starting point. So from there you have to build, uh, and I, I suppose the argument would be that if I give up the flat earth, then I'm going to have to give up, you know, the old earth or the, you know, that it was a young earth. And then I'm going to have to give up that there's a foundation to belief in the scriptures. And then I'm going to have to give up the belief that there's objective morality and purpose and meaning of life that religion provides. And before you know it, you're one of these materialist atheists that has no, no grounding in morals or meaning. And then, and then where are you? So they, they draw the line early in the sand. Mm -hmm. I'd say, where are you? You're having a lot of fun, but anyway, um, it's, it, that's exactly right. It's a very, uh, it's a very binary way of looking at the world. And I also want to point out that 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 form of thinking gets people into Flat Earth as well. The founder of the uh, FEIC, the Flat Earth Conferences, told me that he got into Flat Earth via biblical literalism because somebody challenged his beliefs. They said, OK, you really think the Bible is the literal inerrant word of God? Well, then you've got to believe that the Earth is flat. And this guy said, you know, by gosh, I think you're right. <laughs> and he, he doubled down that hard. Um, I, I, and I think it's, um, it's a belief system that doesn't allow 
for in-betweens. It doesn't really allow for uh, for wiggle room or um, any any grayness in belief and in, in possibilities. A psychologist that I spoke to for this book said that when she is working with people who have um, very fringe beliefs and she's trying to help reintroduce them to the uh, more mainstream world, she introduces them to this concept of living in the gray, which is accepting that you can be skeptical, but also that you don't need to ground your life in skepticism. Accepting that things may or may not be true and that you don't necessarily need to have a uh, militant viewpoint on all of them. It's allowing room for doubt. And that's something that I think a lot of people in flat earth don't have. And although doubt sounds scary, I think it's actually something very healthy to live with. It's a very healthy thought process to allow yourself to change your mind, and to um, reevaluate your beliefs and not to dig in, which is exactly what flat earthers are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Richard Dawkins calls this the tyranny of the discontinuous mind. That is, everything is binary. Well, actually, most things are not binary. <laughs> but if you think they are, then you're going to have a hard time wrapping your mind around difficult issues like abortion, when does life begin, or immigration, what's the right percentage of people we're going to let in, or, or whatever. Most of life is pretty gray. I like that, that living in the gray. That's a great uh, term. Um, and I think that explains a lot of current politics. Uh, you know, the idea of compromising with the other party at the moment, that just seems, you know, like tyrannous, right? I mean, Sean Hannity's going to hammer you if you're a politician and you dare to talk to Democrats, even go out to lunch with them and maybe make a compromise. That, that's now considered, you know, kind of being traitorous to your party. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of the same thought processes that inspire conspiracy beliefs do inspire a lot of political beliefs right now. We have a very team centric view of politics. And as you say, it doesn't really allow for nuance. It doesn't allow for backtrack. Oh, my goodness. If you're caught backtracking in politics, you're a you're a hypocrite. You're a flip flopper. And in actuality, that doesn't take into account any uh, ability to adjust for evolving situations or to adjust for new information for the possibility that you were wrong. And so I do think that that is why uh, these conspiracy theories like QAnon are so inherently political right now is they graft so neatly onto the red team, blue team mentality of politics right now that it's not just enough for your opposition to be wrong. You can't just say, well, you know, I don't really like liberal tax policies. I've, I'm a bit more fiscally conservative. No, QAnon believers are saying my opponents literally eat babies. You know, it, it's it. You can't parody it because it just blows all all joking out the window. It's already at its uh, at its extreme. Right. Even if you disprove the particular claim, like to Edgar Welch, there's no pedophile ring at this pizzeria, the response might be, well, that's uh, OK. That one's not true, but it's the kind of thing Democrats would do. You know, so it's kind of a mm -hmm. proxy truth like, uh, you know, that the specific ones may not be true. But in general, this is what I think about these people. They would do something like that. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's um, it, it's funny because there's a there's a conservative meme like facts don't care about your feelings. But I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the motivating energy of conspiracy theories and of highly partisan politics is very feeling based. People, if a politician that they support because they feel like they're on that person's team, if that politician does something that appears to betray their values, people will find a reason to justify that. Say, well, Trump, you know, he's only saying he's for vaccines right now because he has to. He he doesn't really believe that. And it's um it's it's a way to construct this alternative narrative about the world that you're in. And 
I would argue that that's very similar to conspiracy belief is uh, picking your team, picking your in-group and constructing alternative facts to uh, to explain away uncomfortable realities. Mm. Is that why if I if you know somebody's position on, say, abortion, you can predict what, what their positions are going to be on immigration and, uh, you know, tax policy or voter uh, ID and, and, and so forth. You know, we're pretty for some, even though those subjects have nothing to do with each other. Why, why would they be tied together like that? I, I think that's exactly right. I think, uh, you know, we we have this sort of duopoly in politics, right, where you have two teams and for the most part, the uh, the slate of political positions is kind of, it, it's just set out for you, right? So rather than break from a, a party policy, especially in this world where, as you say, uh, Sean Hannity will call a politician a traitor for uh, appearing to give an inch, people will lock themselves into that framework. They'll say, this is my team, this is what we believe, and they'll find good reasons to justify positions that, to me, seem at odds with each other, right? If you are supposedly pro-life, well, then why don't you support policies that help young children fiscally? But of course, you know, <laughs> that's that's a decades-long uh, argument, and it doesn't seem to have gained any purchase with a lot of uh, abortion opponents. So yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, like I said, it's a team mentality. And the feelings of belonging and community, I think, figure higher for those believers than the actual facts of, of the uh, of the policy. Yeah, one of my favorite uh, explanations for this is comes from George Lakoff in his books, uh, his book, Moral Politics, that there's a foundational worldview structure beneath each of the two sides that has to do with the metaphor of the family. Is the government like mm. a strict father family or a nurturing mother family? And liberals, you know, they, well, the government should, you know, reach out and help people that, that, that have fallen through the cracks and need a, a, a hand up. And conservatives are like, no, no, they're going to become dependent on the, on the handout. We need to st- discipline them and give them strict rules and laws and, and just sort of like a father would. So like his explanation for abortion, uh, I mean, just, you know, people have sex. They, <laughs> of course, it's a human drive and they don't always use birth control or they don't have access to it. And then they get pregnant. Well, the conservatives answer to that is they just shouldn't be having sex. They should be disciplined. They, they need a father figure to say, you wait till marriage and then you commit to that, you know, that, that, that promise, that pledge and so on. Whereas the, the, the liberal position is, well, but things happen to people. And so we have to, you know, help, help them. Young, young single mothers that, uh, you know, they, they, they can't make it financially, so we have to give them some help. Anyway, so he goes through all these guns, for example. You know, guns are kind of a proxy for a strong father figure at home to protect his family. And, and therefore, gun policy by the government should be that everyone should be able to have a gun if they want, because that's what we need. There's bad people in the world. Um, and, you know, he just sort of goes through all the different p- policies, like immigration, well, you know, if you're a family and you're the head of a family and outsiders are coming in, they're a threat. And it's your job to protect us from these threatening outsiders. In this case, the metaphor being the government should, should have a tight immigration policy. Anyway, I, uh, I, I've been playing with that idea for a, a long time because I like it. Uh, I, I, but it is a metaphor. I'm not sure to what extent people think in metaphorical terms like that, like the government is a strict father family or a nurturing mother family. Uh, but it, it does seem to tie to some of these things together. It does, absolutely. And, you know, I think it's interesting that although Flat Earth shouldn't inherently be political, it is quite conservative. And I think a lot of that is grounded, as you say, in um, biblical literalism. Um, people who are very Christian tend to be conservative. But in Flat Earth conferences, you will hear people go on... Um, on political tangents i remember i was i was only walking into a room at a conference recently and a guy was up on stage and he wasn't um he wasn't talking about flat earth he was talking about how it was evil for mothers to be in the workplace and here i was by the way i was seven months pregnant at that time and i'm there reporting my book and feeling pretty good as a you know soon to be working mom and i said what does this have to do with flat earth at all and yet 
that message was very, I think, affirming for those in-group ideas. People hearing their political beliefs echoed back at them. And I think a, a Flat Earth conference is often sort of a safe space, not just for uh, people who believe in this particular cosmological view, but for people who hold uh, certain conservative beliefs. I think those two uh, ideologies fit really neatly onto each other, even if they don't explicitly have anything in common. Interesting. Well, has anyone done a specific count, gender count, to how many men and women are at these conferences? Or, or, and if not, what's your sense of a ratio? So it's interesting. In the audience, I think it's fairly even. Um, maybe slightly more men, but plenty of women, plenty of families. A lot of, lot of young families there. Um, but I have never seen a Flat Earth conference with, I think, more than three female speakers. It's, um, it's yeah, it, the men talk. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sure there are plenty of women in Flat Earth who would push back at me on that. They say, listen, I have a very popular YouTube channel. I'm a, I'm a guiding voice in a Facebook group. You know, I think women play a very social role in Flat Earth. And I think that sort of follows tra traditional gender schema. But one other thing in Flat Earth, um, and I think this happens a lot in conservative communities, but not necessarily just with them. I think it's an issue with the internet writ large is when women climb high enough within flat earth in terms of fame or influence they get knocked down and uh one example i used in the book was of patricia steer who was probably the biggest female flat earth youtuber and she got pretty popular she's you know beautiful and charismatic and um had a big channel and people started making some conspiracy theories about her um you know just very gendered sexist things or taking the opposite attack uh, and saying that she was secretly transgender and that she was uh, lying to the community. And that doesn't happen to men, you know? There's infighting, but then this, this really was very targeted in a way that I don't think a male flat earth YouTuber would have experienced. So when I look at the breakdown of a flat earth conference and say, why aren't the women speaking? I, I suspect that's part of it is, um, there are repercussions for being a very visible female flat earther. Yeah, some of them were, were pretty funny. What the last three letters, Patricia C I A. Oh, mm -hmm. there's a it's like a cue drop. Ooh, there's a hint. <laughs> or her last name is Steer. Yeah. So she's steering people into or out of the group. And and since she's an attractive woman, oh, she's a honeypot trying to uh, uh, get these these young men interested in it and or whatever it is, whatever the claim was about her. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's interesting, I guess. Again, like women entering any industry or field for the first time seem to encounter that, you know, physics or math or biology or any any scientific field. You know, now we're come a long ways and but but you know, that's kind of how it was in the bad old days of the nineteen fifties. Um and so that's interesting that the social group operates that way. Another thing I'm interested in with social groups is how they splinter. Um, mm -hmm. you know, like feminist groups, you know, are you a true feminist or Marxist groups? You, you're not a true Marxist because you endorse this policy rather than that one. Even, even atheists have kind of splintered up about, about how militant you should, are supposed to be as an atheist to try to deconvert uh, believers or, you know, to what extent you support social justice issues, not just, you know, no God stuff. And, uh, and so groups have splintered over that. I, w I wonder if there's any of these kinds of ideological divides within the 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 uh, flat earth community yes and i <laughs> i find it fascinating because you know i i am uh lefty groups hold a a strong place in my heart but the infighting is just wild and so it was very funny to see it take place in almost identical format in flat earth groups and there are warring groups sometimes over theory but often just over uh personality clashes the um the flat earth society which it, it it used to be very serious now i i suspect that some of its louder voices are kind of joking but they they do in all apparent seriousness offer a fairly comprehensive 
theory of flat earth. Unfortunately, it is not the theory favored by people at the Flat Earth International Conference, for example. So if you go to one of these conferences, they will be very upfront and they will say, media, take note, we are not the Flat Earth Society. We think they are a disgrace. We think they are a oh. hoax. And there are some, there's some bitter words that have spoken to the Flat Whoa. Earth Society who said like, we didn't make it toxic. Like, it, it, it sounds like YouTube drama to me. Um, it's very funny. It sounds like the fights that you would see play out over any interest group, be that right, left, feminist, ecological. Um, and then, of course, there are the, uh, the theory debates that are masking uh, personal issues. Um, when, for example, Patricia Steer did have that, um, that smear campaign against her, people fell into opposing sides very quickly. There were people who sided with her, um, with her attackers, and there were people who came to her defense. And that played out in a really strange um, proxy battle of beliefs. People got kicked off YouTube, people got shunned. And so it's um, for something that should already be a very small community, you would think people would try to stick together and keep that cohesion and community that they have. It doesn't always work that way. People do fight with each other and it is over something that, you know, 99% of the world would think is impossible. And yet they manage to have a disagreement within that small circle. Yeah, you wonder how much of it is just power, um, like Lenin, Trotsky, and, and Stalin, uh, you know, and then Trotsky gets executed in Mexico after being exiled. Well, how different really is Trotskyism from Leninism? Well, there are differences, but really, to me, you look at that episode, you think, I think these guys are just fighting for power and money and, and whatever else status in, in the group. I think that, I think the issue of power is very integral to um, conspiracy communities, especially now that they're online. It's not just enough to be a, a conspiracy believer. People want to be influencers as well. People want to have that popular YouTube channel or the Instagram account, something like that. And so I think there it's a business motive. You make a lot of money if you have a popular account and you also get that dopamine hit of new followers and people looking up to you. So I think there is a, a very perverse incentive for people to get in these spats, right? People to assert their dominance over this other channel or to build alliances with a channel. Um, and I, I think that's a hugely motivating factor within this ecosystem of people putting out their beliefs and feuding. And um, yeah, that's, I think that's often very overlooked is how much this social media driven economy is really shaping the way conspiracy theories look. So for my uh, listeners who are OK boomers like me and don't really understand how all this works, how do you make money on YouTube or any of the other social media channels? Well, on YouTube, you can monetize your channel. It means um, for every video that someone watches, you get, you know, two cents, whatever. Um, there are, of course, caveats to that. YouTube has started demonetizing some um, objectionable content, which sometimes includes Flat Earth. Um, but you can just very passively make money by putting a video out and people watch it. However, a lot of Flat Earth YouTubers make money from a, a much more personal relationship that they cultivate with their viewers. And they say, you're on my team. Like, I'm, I'm your guy. I'm your influencer. I got your back. And for that relationship, can you chip into my Patreon? Can you buy my T-shirt or my book? Uh, you know, so it's um, it, it's. It's a very two sided people call it a parasocial relationship where one side of the relationship feels very strongly for this influencer figure. They really feel like they know them and that this person is important in their life and the influencer figure doesn't know them at all. Um, and I, I can't be entirely critical of that. You know, I have podcasts that I support. I have authors that I like and those figures do, I think, Play a somewhat important role in my life. I think it's something that everybody feels to an extent, but conspiracy influencers, I think, are an exceptionally cynical version of that because 
they're telling their listeners that only I'm going to tell you the truth. Everybody else is lying to you. I'm going to help show you the way. And why wouldn't you give someone money then if you thought that they were one of the sole truth speakers online? Mm -hmm. Almost like a cult leader. Yeah, and that Mm -hmm. Behind the Curve uh, (laughs) film, they featured that guy, Mark Sargent, who's wearing a big black T-shirt with white letters, I'm Mark Sargent. And then he's in an unintentionally funny moment. He's like, and and I'm being recognized. People come up to me on the street and they go, are you Mark Sargent? It's like, dude, you're wearing a T-shirt that says I'm Mark Sargent. (laughs) It's just Mm -hmm. I can't imagine doing something like that. It's, again, probably unintentionally funny, but it was. It it is funny. I've spoken with Mark many times. I've met him in person. And he is a celebrity in the flat earth world. You know, you go to a conference and he is getting groupies. I, I don't mean that in an untoward way, but people are, hey, Mark, I, I had this idea. Can I bounce it off you? And I think to to really any social person, I think that's a very powerful dynamic. People want to feel important. They want to feel like their yeah. opinion is sought after. Um, and so I, I think even from even someone starting with the best intentions, if they are fed that that love and that respect, why wouldn't you continue to, to act that way and to nurture it? Do you have an opinion on social media in a, in a broader way along these lines that it's not good for people? And, you know, there's this new, these new studies on uh, teenagers uh, who have a, a spike in, in depression, anxiety, self uh, cutting and suicidal ideation and so on. Some of that's blamed on social media. There's kind of an ongoing debate. Gene Twenge wrote that book, iGen, in which he, you know, identified social media as probably the cause. But there's other psychologists that say, no, it's it, it, it's probably something else. And I don't know how, how much you've, you've given thought to that, but, uh, you know, to what extent social media, it was, you know, it was going to liberate the world and we can all talk to one another, but maybe it hasn't worked out quite so, so well. Yeah, I, you know, I I go back and forth on this a lot because I, I like to keep an open mind. And I do think there are some elements of social media that have been absolutely revolutionary, right? And you think about the way that parts of the Arab Spring were conducted via Twitter, the way that social media has democratized a lot of information access, um, a freed people for creative expression. And... Yeah, of course, there is an obvious dark side. Um, they, I, I mentioned how the algorithms are are incentivized to promote things that aren't true. Um, I think a lot of the disinformation uh, that fueled the Trump campaign, I don't think that would have worked in a pre-social media age. So it, it's hard to objectively say, you know, good or bad. It depends what you value. Um, do you value... Uh, unfettered free speech and if so what consequences are you comfortable with Um, you might say the consequences be damned we're going to leave this thing open but I think you do have to acknowledge that there are definite ills that come of social media at the same time I don't also I don't always want to blame things like um like depression and isolation on social media. I think they might be representative of other uh, social forces and economic forces that young people are facing right now. Um, and that social media kind of gets scapegoated uh, for what I think are otherwise sort of crumbling systems of community outside schools and outside the computer. So. It's hard for me as, you know, not a social scientist to diagnose it. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, remain, I remain skeptical about the internet, but very, very addicted to it is what I'll say. <laughs> no, that's funny. Yes, it, it is hard not to go on it. I, I enjoy just scrolling through my Twitter feed to see what the people I follow are posting. Uh, usually articles that I want to read, I could spend hours just reading articles like, oh, here's one in the Atlantic. Here's one in the New Yorker. Oh, I got to read this. Got to read this. Or you know what, hours have gone by and I'm not getting any work done. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm not a teenager where I'm also wrapped up in the social 
aspects of social media in which, you know, I FOMO, I didn't, you know, fear of, of missing out. I didn't, I didn't get invited to the party or whatever. I, I, I could see how that would be upsetting to a teenager. Um, but the question is what to do about it. I mean, this idea we should break up the tech companies, the government needs to, you know, uh, you know, bring in the, the regulators and, and either break up Facebook or, or, you know, slap some strict regulations on them, which makes me nervous because, you know, who's going to decide what speech we're going to censor on social media, you know, and that, you know, that, that has a slippery slope to it. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a very double edged sword there. Um, and again, this is, you know, uh, speaking as someone broadly on the left, I find that almost every time we ask for sanctions against extremist content on the right, there's a bit of a backswing. Um, Facebook likes to do things in, um, in tandem. It likes to have a sense of um, symmetry in its actions. So it says, okay, yeah, we'll, um, we'll ban uh, the Proud Boys Facebook group, but we're also going to ban this anarchist page that I actually read, because not that I'm an anarchist, but I think it's an interesting perspective. So you, and I, and that's also a very U.S. centric view. Uh, I think it's uh, more ripe for exploitation under uh, more authoritative governments overseas. So it's, um, it's something I'm very cagey about. I do agree that there are targeted instances where something is vile, something is harmful and should be removed for imminent personal safety. But I, I do get a little nervous when people talk in very sweeping statements about content removal. So I think my compromise position is, okay, we have these algorithms that artificially promote harmful content. Well, fix the algorithm, you know, that in itself is distorting what we see. And that in itself, you can make more content neutral. And I think that's, um, that should be a compromise that more people can get on board with. Mm hmm. Right. More bottom up activism against social media companies to tweak the algorithms so that they don't lead to these deep rabbit holes. I guess the law hanging fruit would be something like if ISIS is recruiting people on Facebook, Zuckerberg should probably do something about that. That seems pretty obvious. Uh, what about the rigged election conspiracy theory people? Well, then, well, if them, what about QAnon? Because that's adjacent. And, and what about 9 11? That's adjacent. 11 truthers and then 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 you're at uh, the flat earthers because they as you talk about one of your chapters you know they're into the whole 9 11 truth thing also so you, you kind of you, as you're sliding along pretty soon you're gonna if you take that to the extreme you're gonna have to ban the the flat earth uh people from the internet and that that seems wrong yeah i mean facebook has been doing it flat earthers have been having a hard time keeping their pages online but it's like mm. you say, it's a slippery slope. Where do you draw the line exactly? I don't want to be the one to decide that. I'm not important enough for that. But it's um, it's um, it all exists in a gradient. You can say that stop the steal election truthers are actively harmful. I do agree. I think they're actively harmful for democracy. How much of it do you ban is the question. And um, I'm going to leave that up for another book, I think. <laughs> there's your there's your follow up book. <laughs> Right. So what's the connection with Flat Earth and 9-11 truthers and the whole and the whole sequence of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that go back deep into history? I thought that was one of the more disturbing chapters in your book. Yeah. So um, I, I have this chapter, as you say, about a lot of uh, anti-Semitism in Flat Earth. And I think anti-Semitism is one of humanity's longer running conspiracy theories. It's, it follows the pattern of a lot of conspiracy theories where it takes a minority group and makes them a scapegoat for, uh, you know, a broad plot against the rest of the people. Um, and because it's such a long-running conspiracy theory and because it's been so vir virulent until very recently, so out in the open, a lot of conspiracy frameworks are built on anti-Semitism. Ideas that, you know, there's a secret communist plot in the government a lot of it has very anti-Semitic roots. You don't have to look very far for it. So when flat earthers are coming to the ideology and they're looking for uh, touch points in the past, either consciously or unconsciously, they often latch on to old conspiracy theories that um, are, are, are very anti-Semitic and very, I think, very harmful. And then 
This also happens from an intentional perspective. There are some people who started as anti-Semites and who got into Flat Earth and who realize that they can import that into Flat Earth. Um, and that, I think, uh, listen, I'm, I am a little protective of some Flat Earth people. I think they're wrong, but I think they're nice and I think they are well-intentioned. There are people who are coming into Flat Earth with the intention of Nazifying it. And that I take very uh, extreme alarm and great offense to. Uh, so, yeah, th there are people who are saying, you're looking for who is concealing the shape of the Earth? I have an answer for you. And they'll bring out the protocols of the elders of Zion. And, you know, they'll just all this centuries of anti-Semitic folklore that was just waiting to go, waiting for a new conspiracy theory to resuscitate it. And that's what's happening. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that in some of the Holocaust denier conferences I attended, they, they had for sale at the book table, uh, the protocols, uh, Henry Ford's book, the Etern what was it the Eternal Jew, I think. Um, yeah. Mein Kampf, of course, you have to have to have Mein Kampf for sale. And but the sense was, you can't get these anywhere but here. They don't want you to read this material, which engages the brain to go, well, if somebody says I can't have it. I really want to see it, right? So that would be an argument against censorship. It's that in-group, out-group um, ideology again, right? It's we are the only ones who are going to provide this to you. Um, and I mean, with something like Mein Kampf, I mean, it's while you don't want it in circulation, it's also important that people understand the impact that it had and that it continues to have. So where exactly do you draw the line? I mean, I, uh, this is going to get clipped out of context. I, I can see it already, but I do think it should be available for purchase. And like, I, it was in, it was in my library yes. growing up, yes, um, of course. It, my town library. And it's, it's, it is one of the most destructive pieces of literature available. And it's also one of the most historically important ones. So yeah. it's a uh, man, it's, when you talk about censorship, you have to take into account those uh, those realities of history. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like some of the movements now to to defenestrate Mark Twain from high school uh, literature classes because he used the N word, which in context he used it even then as uh, a critique of you know the way white Southern whites were treating blacks and. And, you know, again, the moment you, you start down that road, there's just too much material that could easily be interpreted as, you know, offensive to somebody. Therefore, somebody should do something about it. But I, I, I like the argument more of like, if you ban it, then people are going to want it. If it's just available, if you try to read Mein Kampf, it is a really a boring book. It's maybe because if I read German, maybe it'd be, it'd be more interesting. But, um, you know, but, but you got to know, what were these people thinking? Well, one of the things they were thinking was they read this book. Well, what did they read in this book? Or like the Turner Diaries. You know, the turn. this is, again, it's not a great read. But, uh, you know, Timothy McVeigh had a copy of the Turner Diaries in his truck after he blew up the Oklahoma City building. And it's like, whoa, what's with this Turner Diaries? Mm -hmm. We should read this thing to find out what it is people are getting out of this. Yeah, I think, I, I think the best way to approach this and something that I consider a lot in my journalism because I do report on extremist movements is, okay, what am I doing that's amplifying this, what, what's unnecessarily spreading it? And what am I doing that's contextualizing it, helping people understand and hopefully combating this information? And I think, um, I, I think to relegate some, uh, a book to this uh, secret but elevated place it, it can do damage. And I think what we should instead be doing is interrogating the forces that brought it into, um, into wide circulation and the networks that promote it because there are, you know, neo-Nazi networks that spread that book everywhere. Um, and the people profiting from it. I think, you know, a book isn't, a book isn't just a text. It's a, it's an interaction between the author and the publishing house and the readers. And there's so much more to interrogate um, 
in a book and to combat in the real world than just saying, we're just going to take that off the shelf. Do I want to see the Turner Diaries in my library? Honestly, I don't. But it's, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's something that uh, is here whether we like it or not. So I think it makes sense to understand it and to take meaningful action against it. Yeah, and then from there you go even to the darker corner of the web where you can buy books on how to build bombs, uh, how to poison people without it being detected, you know, how to get off the grid, how to not pay taxes. I, I, I did a whole um, research thing on sovereign citizens because I was brought in for a trial as an expert witness on cults and belief systems in general by the defense. The defense attorney wanted to argue that his client kind of got suckered into this cult and uh, you know, he didn't mean to not pay taxes for 20 years. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I thought it was kind of weird that I'm on the defense. But the question was, did, did he really believe it? So, um, you know, for this, they, they sent me all the videos he watched of these conferences he went to, these sovereign citizen conferences, where, you know, it's a little known fact that, you know, the, the income tax law was never ratified by Congress, whatever amendment that was. And, and, and therefore, you don't actually have to pay taxes. And here's why. And then you know, you go through this whole laundry list of arguments. By the end, if you're just sitting there in the hotel room and that's and you know nothing about this because who would know about tax law or whatever? You know, it's like that makes sense. Boom, boom, boom. And all of a sudden it's like, so don't file with the IRS. Oh, OK. I went to one of these when I was an undergraduate at Pepperdine with my roommate and uh, and he 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 went into the whole thing. He didn't pay taxes for him in like 15 years and they finally caught up with. Him. But I remember thinking. After I walked away, you know, a couple hours later, it's like, you know what? This can't be true because if it was true, who the hell would pay taxes? No one wants to pay taxes. So, you know, surely this would have been challenged already and the government would have done something about it or they would have ratified the correctly ratified the amendment or whatever the claim was. And uh, and yet uh, and yet a lot of people just kind of go down that rabbit hole, much like the flat earth and and think, you know, I have this inside information. And in this case, I'm going to save a lot of money. This guy. Uh, you know, he, he, he made millions of dollars. He lived in Hawaii and, uh, uh, and he had a pretty good life until he got caught up with him. Yeah. I mean, it, it goes back to the same motivating, uh, factors as flat earth, right? Someone is selling you the truth that you already want to believe you, you want to believe that you don't have to fork over your paycheck. And so if you hear it from like enough authoritative voices, you start to believe it. It's, um, I don't think people can necessarily be completely tricked into this. I don't think you can start at zero and be pulled into uh, conspiracy belief. I think it requires some participation on your end as well. Um, and it's it again, you're never going to completely remove sovereign citizen pamphlets from the Internet or those videos. I mean, the Internet is too big to fully adequately censor even if you wanted to but what you can do is you can prosecute the people doing wrong you can prosecute there's um oh goodness what's his name there's old timer um sovereign citizen fellow out west who only recently he, he it caught up with him he caught massive charges for this grift that he was running for years telling people that you didn't need to pay your taxes and that you could squat on land and it would become yours and Okay, that's what you can actually go after. You can't prosecute the ideology, but in this case, there's a very literal crime taking place, and it's unfortunate that there are um, victims of that crime, that there are people who fall for it when they shouldn't. But there is often a, uh, a, um, an enterprising individual at work, and that's something that you can take meaningful action against. Mm-hmm. Trying to find this uh, a chapter on the sovereign citizens in my next book, which is on conspiracy theories. Let's see, here it is, chapter chapter five. This guy, this was the second trial I was uh, involved in, it, which involved uh, what's called a, a, an OID, a 1099 OID or original issue discount. I'll just read this. It's a form of interest. It is the excess of a debt's instruments stated redemption price at maturity over its issue price. A 1099 OID applies to debt instruments such as bonds and notes that were discounted at purchase. The tax is the difference between the instrument's actual value and the discounted purchase price. 1099 OID fraud consists of filing form 1099 OID, 
with a false withholding information to reduce taxable income. So this guy, Miles Julison was his name, and his, his trial was in uh, Oregon. Amazingly, the IRS sent Julison a check in the amount of $411,000, which he spent on a home loan, credit card bills, a Mercedes-Benz, and a boat. <laughs> Emboldened by his success, the next year, Julison reported $2.3 million in interest income and demanded a refund of $1.5 million. This time, however, instead of a refund check, he got an IRS investigation. That's how he ended up uh, in this. And uh, what was interesting, though, is because I met this guy and talked to him a little bit, and he, he was totally a, a, a sovereign citizen, a true believer. And, and, and this is the kind of thing he would say on the stand in defense. And in print, for and on the record, I am here under express duress in propia persona. I am Miles Joseph, creation of Christ Jesus. I reserve all of my unalienable rights without prejudice. UCC 1-308, Declaration of Independence, nunc pro tunc, preteria, preteria, and without the state. My jurisdiction is in harmony with the common law, UCC 1-103. I refuse for cause all testimony of this court. And it is not under penalty of perjury, 28 U.S.C. 7146, Clause 1. My silence does not preclude a contract whatsoever. The UCC is the Universal Commercial Code. So they have this, like, this language, almost like the words are talismanic. If I say the words in the right order, the judge is going to go, oh, you're free, go ahead. <laughs> it's just astonishing to me. Yeah, it's amazing. And what's funny is that a flat earther I know actually got into conspiracy theories partially because he had a similar sovereign citizen trick that accidentally got him like four hundred dollars. Once he's like, "It's real. It's 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 all coming true for me." Um, but I mean, there are there's a uh, not a particularly kind subreddit, but I do visit it occasionally, which is just sovereign citizens trying this stuff in the real world, trying the secret code in the courtroom or the the password that you tell a police officer and it's just not materializing for them and the look on their faces of trying to reconcile what is a firmly held belief that they can recite these words in a certain order and the key will unlock to the secret you know series of laws and the reality which is you're under arrest you need a real license plate on your car I, those two things, it's its a moment of, as you say, cognitive dissonance. Okay, why isn't this working? Did I get the Latin wrong or um, are laws real? And yeah, that's, um, that's something that unfortunately these conspiracy theories have consequences. And for a lot of people, it's, it's jail or it's being defrauded. Uh, it's losing friends, looking dumb on the internet. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very common phenomenon. Yeah, at the end of this, toward the end of this trial, the um, the state prosecutor said, "Look, we don't we don't want to jail this guy. We just want our money with interest and and uh, penalties. So you know, just just tell him to plead guilty." And and nope, he refused. And his wife and kids were in the courtroom. And I thought, oh my god, this guy is going to just walk away from his family in, in this belief. I mean, he that's a true believer. Uh, I've just found this astonishing. And uh, I was trying to find the. Oh, um, let's see. Yeah, outside the, on a lunch break outside the courtroom, Julison walked past me. So I took the opportunity to ask him if he really believes all these sovereign citizen claims, or if he's just in it for the money. As my testimony was done and I was heading home, I hoped for honesty. He was as unequivocal in his conviction as he was adamant in his mannerisms. As he told me, "quote The United States is a corporation in the state of Delaware. I have the registration papers printed right off their website." Before anything can be argued, there has to be a jurisdiction established. In other words, he's arguing that the state doesn't have a right to try me. So I said, so my description of you as a true believer is true? I inquired, referencing my own testimony in court, that I did not think he was just a con man pretending to be a sovereign citizen. And he responded, I believe in the blood of the lamb. <laughs> it's just that amazing. That sounds like a true believer. Yeah, I got a, I, yeah. I got sovereign citizens a couple months ago uh, trying to sue me. They sent me what looked like a, a lawsuit saying that for every day I didn't answer, I owed them, you know, three hundred thousand dollars. And so, <laughs> oh you God. know, okay, sure, file <laughs> away because there's there's no there there's no consequences about that. It's just annoying. So what, it's, what were they I suing mean, you over? Because you wrote about them. Yes, I wrote about them. Um, 
They were involved in a uh, standoff with police that blocked a mm. Massachusetts highway uh, for, oh, yeah, I for that. maybe eight hours. Yeah, it was those folks. Um, and because I know enough about sovereign citizens, I saw that. I'm like, oh, God, these guys again. And I you know, wrote about them, and they didn't take very kindly to it. So I'm, I'm waiting for the, uh, the court summons for I must still owe them <laughs> 300 million at this point. But we'll see how that pans out. <laughs> Maybe if your book sales are really good, you can pay them off. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. So, but you must, so you have met some flat earthers who, oh, wait, before I, before I just that link to 9-11 truth. So what's the link? Is it that, um, that the evidence of around earth, like pictures from space, they have to be faked. Uh, and they're faked by who? By NASA. NASA is a government agency. The government lies to us. The government lied to us about 9-11. Is that the kind of the through line there? I think often it, it sort of actually happens the other way around because I think 9-11 truth is a much more popular conspiracy theory, or at least it's wider spread. You know, you don't have to be uh, necessarily conservative to believe it. It had a lot of liberal proponents as well. Um, so it's a conspiracy theory that a lot of people found accessible um, and people were looking for it on YouTube when be it via um, the YouTube algorithm or just finding conspiratorial communities that led them from content about 9-11 to content about Flat Earth. And they're compatible in the sense that they both allude to a massive government cover-up, uh, you know, huge malice within the um, elite class. And so although they don't necessarily have to have any like scriptural connections, um, they do work hand in hand, and I think of 9-11 Truth as a potential stepping block to Flat Earth, where you can get into that and it can open the door to f uh, further theories, Flat Earth being among them. Mm, right. So if, they'll, if they lie to us about this, what else have they lied to us about? The fact is the mm -hmm. government does lie to citizens. We know this from WikiLeaks and Pentagon Papers, the Afghanistan Papers. Um, so, uh, I, sometimes I see this a little sympathetically to the conspiracy theorists because, well, you know, it, it happens often enough that it kind of pays to be a little paranoid because sometimes they are out to get you or at least out to lie to you. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's something I had to, I think, state quite far up front in the book as I'm saying, listen, I'm writing about conspiracy theories, but I'm not saying conspiracies don't happen. They do. Um, what we just need to be aware of is how much skepticism is reasonable to live with. That said, I think being um, aware of real conspiracy theories actually helps me um, better report on the subject matter. And one instance, I remember I was at a recent Flat Earth conference and somebody, it was almost like a litmus test, but like, okay, what theories do you believe? I'm like, Yo, you want to talk about U.S. intervention in Latin America? Let's go. Like, let's hit, let's right. hit the bar. You'll want to shut me up. Um, and it's because, you know, real collusion does happen. There are real yes. nefarious schemes. And it's a matter of separating the insane from the things that actually merit scrutiny. And that's, that's what I try to do as a journalist. Yeah. Yes, right. Uh, if you look at the shenanigans by the CIA in South American and Central American countries in the 60s and 70s of kind of helping to rig elections. And, you know, we want the fascist dictator instead of the communist dictator because the fascists are friendlier to American business interests and so forth. And you read about this, you go, wait, our government was doing what? <laughs> Why is that our business? I thought mm -hmm. these were countries that are independent and autonomous and, you know, so on. Like, okay, well, if they can do that, then I can see why people think they would do other things. Mm -hmm. And it has very much the aura of a conspiracy theory where you might learn about it in college or as an adult, and you say, I didn't hear about that at all growing up. Was this hidden from me? And it's not so much deliberately hidden as, you know, not discussed. It's, uh, it's not always kosher to bring that up in, in a school. We have a very patriotic education system where uh, you might you might have a social studies teacher who's a bit more open about that but it's not really in the curricula so um in some ways i think our reluctance to discuss real conspiracies does maybe inflame our conspiracy our conspiratorial tendencies where we can recognize that sometimes we're being lied to and it's up to us to figure out exactly 
where that begins and ends. Mm. Well, Kelly, we've been going almost an hour and a half here. Just give us some advice on how to talk to a flat earther, a QAnoner, a 9-11 truther, or a rigged election conspiracy theory or whatever. You know, you're at Christmas dinner, Thanksgiving dinner, family holiday, or just the Sunday dinner, and, you know, crazy Uncle Bob brings up QAnon or flat earth or the rigged election. What, what do you say? You know, it's tough, and I, I don't always follow my own advice here, but the best <laughs> way to deconvert someone is with respect. You know, not treating it as a debate that you're going to win. And again, I'm so guilty of this. I watch YouTube debates all the time, but treating it as a conversation of saying, okay, well, why do you think that? And what motivated you to that belief? And another tactic that I um, somebody told me about in this book is asking, figuring out the places where a conspiracy theory has failed someone, right? Where they've been told that um, Hillary Clinton will be uh, arrested on X date or that Trump will be restored to the presidency. And talk about all the times that that led them on, that that hurt them by not materializing. And well, who profited from telling you that? Um, what are you losing from continuing to believe in that? And it's not an easy conversation to have because one, it's, it's very frustrating. And two, as we said, people don't want to revert on their beliefs and they especially don't want to be seen reverting on their beliefs. But I think by keeping it human and, um, giving people kind of a soft place to land, not to make fun of them when they do exit a theory. I think that can help. And, um, you know, conspiracy theories are kind of about a lack of trust. And if you can rebuild a little interpersonal trust, I think that's one of the best things you can do to help someone. Right. So, um, what so you could ask something like, what would it take to change your mind? Um, like, okay, so what's the next prediction that, you know, that, that Trump will be back in the white house. I think there was three or four of these over the, 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 the last six months. And, uh, so it, it didn't happen. So you could, I mean, maybe you could do something like, okay, I'll, I'll make you a little bet, <laughs> you know, that if Trump's not in the white house by September 1st, then you're wrong and I'm right. But maybe huh, that won't. Yeah. Maybe, 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 maybe not quite so confrontational. I don't know though, because. I don't, I don't bet, you know, I ethically, I can't really meddle in politics, but I did have a de facto one of those happen. And I was interviewing shortly after Trump's loss, I was interviewing somebody who had put money on Trump being elected. And he said, well, just you wait and see come election day. He's or come uh, January 6th, I believe he's going to be ratified and restored to the presidency. And I'm going to make so much money on this bet. And I said, Okay, you let me know when that happens, and I never heard of him again. <laughs> never so, heard of him again, right? I like to think that may maybe there was a moment of consideration there, certainly a considered choice not to follow up. Yeah, is there something that if you encounter a flat earther, you could just say, "Well, let's go outside and look," or look through this telescope, or is there some simple test you could do that you and the other person could agree that you know that that's wrong? Well, I can't guarantee agreement, but one of the best things you can do is go watch the sunset, go to the beach and watch it set over the horizon. And it's so striking and it's so easy. And you see the sunset degree by degree, and it simply doesn't work on a flat earth model. You can explain that to a five-year-old and they'd understand. So often people are willfully ignorant of that evidence, but it's, um, it's just one of the most powerful demonstrations you can have. And it's really beautiful. And at the end of the day, you know, I, I'm kind of a space geek. I, I love that we have this cool planet and that you can see all these astrological phenomena and that that's one of the easiest things. You don't need any equipment. You can just sit on a beach and watch it. And uh, that's what I'd prescribe for someone who's challenging their beliefs in flat earth. Mm hmm. One of my favorite graphics is that one with the solar system with all the round planets. And then the third one out is this little flat disc. It's like, that's the only one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's hard to argue this. It doesn't necessarily sound that nice when you say it, but we're actually not that special. It's a big universe. And if you can accept that that is cool, then I, I think that's a nice framework for 
accepting round earth and uh just our uh our place in the universe yeah but the problem you bring up of getting people to convert i wrote about that in my biography of alfred russell wallace who you wrote about also when he read an ad by that uh, flat earther hampton uh, you know, like th this is a typical thing fringers do, you know, I'll give you 500 bucks if you're 500 pounds, I guess it was, if you can prove the earth is round. So they went to the old Bedford canal that, that's been used by the flat earth for a long time. And here you can see the diagrams that Wallace published of, you know, what it would like if it looked, what it would look like if it was flat, what it would look like if it, if the earth is round and then what he actually observed through the telescope. And they had a neutral uh, judges that would look through the little telescope and go, Oh yeah, it's bending down just a little bit or it's not. And it was clear Wallace was right and the other guy was wrong. And he, you know, he, Wallace spent like 15 years chasing him down through court cases. And this guy was, you know, defaming him right and left and writing nasty letters to his wife and so on. Just, in other words, the, the experiment is for show. They're not going to look at that and go, oh, I was wrong. Very yeah, rarely. absolutely. Just like, <laughs> just like I said, it, it takes someone's investment to get into a theory. It takes someone's investment not to deconvert. And John Hampton, I think, an internet troll before his time, an internet troll working in the 1800s, just refusing to concede defeat and sending terrible uh, spam mail to everybody that uh, Russell knew and j just awful, just an absolute waste of his time. So that's why, I mean, I don't, I don't really debate flat earthers. And like I said, I think if you're going to have this deconversion process, it's probably best with somebody that, um, the flat earther personally knows and they trust and it's not in there's not 500 pounds on the line it was not someone's public um public shame and uh you know standing on the line it's it should be a bit more of a personal process and one that offers healing at the end right when you have somebody high up in your team that says you know we were wrong uh, that usually that usually works to bring most people around, but it didn't with the rigged election conspiracy theory. I was so surprised when Attorney General Barr, you know, with the with all the resources of the Department of Justice and all those court cases, 30, 40 of them around the country, uh, many of them Republican judges, some of them they were appointed by Trump. And they said, you know, we looked into it. There's no election fraud. I thought, well, that'll do it because that's these that's their guy, A.G. Barr. I mean, he's like a big Trump supporter. He's Mr. Republican. He says no mm -hmm. fraud. Astonishingly, that didn't do it, at least for a lot of the hardcore ones. Trumpers. Yeah, I mean, the the election fraud people are they have less evidence than flat earthers at this point. You no, know, flat earthers will have their own sort of parody of the scientific method that they pass off. Election fraud people are just post fact, post truth and post evidence uh it, it it has been astonishing to watch and i think um i think they're just generating their own momentum trump is their guy but maybe even more than that they are their own team and they are so invested uh identity wise in this theory that i mean i don't really know how you disengage them i've i've tried and it's um i mean i've gone nowhere Right. I know. I feel sorry for Republicans who are kind of old school, maybe Bob Dole, John McCain kind of Republicans who are principled, who are just to the right of center. They must be just be appalled by what's happened to the GOP. I've written a series of stories focusing on those characters and more than appalled, they're getting purged from their local GOPs. They're getting kicked out of leadership positions. They're becoming pariahs in communities that they used to lead and they used to command a lot of respect in. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm going to use the term 50 times, but in group, out group, they, uh, they committed the cardinal sin of that group and it was disloyalty to Trump. It was disloyalty to this conspiracy theory that makes people feel good. This theory that says Trump didn't actually lose. And um, for that, they are cast aside. They're not as important as that belief. That scene a couple of weeks ago with Liz Cheney and Dick Cheney sitting on the right there in Congress all by themselves, not a single Republican politician there. And I thought, wow, Dick Cheney? I mean, this guy was Voldemort. I mean, he was, he was Darth Vader. I mean, he was the far right militant wing of the GOP, not what, 10, 15 years ago. Whoa. He's now the moderate guy. 
that's pretty telling. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's so um, identity and emotionally based rather than policy based because policy, you know, he's like you said, quite to the right. And yet uh, what is motivating, I think, a lot of the now mainstream GOP is not policy positions, but uh, rage and um, a sense of belonging to this group that is collectively very, very angry together. And if you can't get on board, it doesn't really matter how bona fide your right wing credentials are. The uh, the party right now is one of election trutherism. Mm hmm. Yeah, we need a we need a strong centrist GOP. And we don't have that now. Just the way the system works, you know, checks and balances and each side pushes back against the other and, and nothing gets too crazy. Change happens slowly. Okay. And so I'm worried about 2024. We'll see. I don't want to, I'm, I'm very much not a doomsayer or apocalyptic. This mm -hmm. is the end of everything. And if I hear one more time in my life, this is the most important election of our lifetime. You know, I'm, I'll scream, but maybe that could be. <laughs> it's, it's tough. You know, it, it's hard to look at the evidence and look at the, um, the narratives percolating right now and not be alarmed. I mean, I've never seen uh, a political system like this where it's so um, there's so little trust in institutions. There's so much advanced willingness to declare uh, any adverse outcome as fraud that, yeah, I think um, I think we have a few years to clean up and we got to get on it because I, I'm also worried about 24. Yeah, I just had Barbara F. Walter on the show, How Civil Wars Start is her new book. And mm -hmm. uh, if you haven't written about her, she's really sharp. She's a political scientist at UC San Diego. And, you know, she really tracks the history of civil wars for like the last century and a half all over the world, you know, hundreds and hundreds of them. So she's got a massive data set. It's a really, it's a really data-driven analysis showing, you know, these are the six things that happened before uh, a civil war breaks out. And, you know, it's not the typical things you expect, like poverty or income inequality, much more of this kind of tribalism sort of thing that happens. And then, you know, a little tilt toward violence, and then violence uh, generates more violence and, and so on. So she kind of outlined exactly what could happen. And I have to say, I'm generally, again, not, not prone toward apocalyptic thinking, but she has me worried. <laughs> so that might be a good story for you, for your Daily Beast mm. uh, piece. Mm, yeah, I'd like to read that because I, um, you know, I often close my computer at the end of the day and I come away pretty worried about the things I'm reading mm -hmm. and writing as well. Mm -hmm. All right. What's next on your on your book writing or, or column or journalistic <laughs> writing projects? Well, I uh, I'm taking an easy Friday and I'm writing about uh, Republican conspiracy theories about furries in school, people who dress up as anthropomorphic animals. Um, Oh my God! There I don't are. Know about this. It would what is shock that? You. Well, <laughs> furries are people who uh, dress up in like mascot costumes, and it's kind of a mm. fun thing they do. It's a community in and of itself. There are now Republican conspiracy theories saying that furry students in schools are dressing as furries, and they're getting all kinds of special bathroom and caf cafeteria accommodations. None of that's true, but it's an excuse for uh, parents on the right to come in and try and. Uh, metal more in school so that's a fun day for me if i can talk to a couple furries Whoa. and um Furry. a couple schools about it i'll uh i'll i'll have a good friday oh my god that's crazy <laughs> all right kelly well thanks for your book it was a delightful read i i listened to it on audio and it's it's well well read as well as well written of course and uh so i really appreciate your work and um stay in touch when you have your next big project out we'll we'll have you back on Okay, thank you so much, Michael. Really appreciate it.